Hi, Kyle Justice here, Awesome Science Media, and I'm at the Northwest Science Museum in Boise, Idaho. All around the country there are uh, different creation museums that you can visit, and this is one, uh, kind of phase one of the museum, and they're planning to build a bigger museum. We'll talk about that with Stan here in a minute, but uh, wanted to take you on a little tour in case you make it to Boise and you want to visit, so let's go in. Ah, there's Stan. Hello, Kyle. <laughs> how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. And this is our uh, our audience for Awesome Science Media. And uh, I'm encouraging them to come visit the museum here. Yeah. How, how long have you guys been here? We've been here three years. Wow, three years. That's yeah. awesome. And I've been working towards the Creation Museum for almost 20 years. Wow, wow. Mm -hmm. And I understand that, uh, like, you know, your, your background isn't in science? My background is in, in uh, farming. Farming? Uh, wow. But I'm also a medical certified medical assistant. So wow. I used to work in doctor's offices and hospitals and stuff. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, part of that's kind of cool because, um, you know, a lot of people have a passion for science and creation. Mm -hmm. And they think, oh, man, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I, I can't start a museum. But if God puts it on your heart, hey, you know, Get going, right? Well, I'll tell you, I've dug more fossils than probably most of these PhD guys in the universities. <laughs> right. I've got tens of thousands of fossils in my shop. Wow. And I process them, and, and I like to make fossils. And one of our goals is to make boxes similar to these ones here that we can uh, trade with other museums or, you know, have them uh, purchase them. Wow, that's great. Well, wow, what types of fossils are in here? It looks like mostly uh, plant fossils. These are all leaf fossils, and these are from the Clarkia fossil beds in Idaho, and they're really important fossils because these are the ones that are in almost all of your school textbooks. Okay. And they're the first fossils that they've actually discovered DNA in. DNA. And I yeah, and I have a I have one of the textbooks right over here. Oh good. They talk about extracting DNA out of them and I actually split some fossils, some rocks up there. Yeah. And one of the magnolia leaves was still green. No, really? Yeah, had chlorophyll in it and it, within 5 or 10 minutes they turned black. Oh wow. Cuz it oxidizes that rapidly. Wow. Well, we could probably talk about that in a couple of minutes. Yeah. You, you know, cuz I I know behind us you we have an exhibit for that. So, so. yeah. Um well, let's start over here. What's uh what's what are you showing at first? Well, we uh we have these fish fossils and trilobite fossils and some are from the Solenhofen limestone where the famous Archaeopteryx comes from. We have these fish fossils here from uh, Kimmer, Wyoming, and these two fish right here are just immaculate fossils, but if you look closely, they're in two different layers. Oh, wow. And this little trilobite's from Utah, and this one's from Morocco. This fish is from uh, Germany, and this crab is from Germany, so these are from all over the world, but they all show rapid burial. Right. Because trilobites are kind of like roly polies, and some of them you find rolled up, but the vast majority of them are laid flat like this, so they got buried so fast that they didn't have time to roll up. That's amazing. Where Where is this from, this layer? The, this is from Morocco. Uh, I would like to have owned the real fossil, but it's just too expensive. I can't own everything. Right. And it took the <coughs> Italian preparator five months to finish this, and they let uh, Joe Taylor make a mold of it. And so I made this replica when I worked with Joe Taylor. And I made a number of these replicas, and, and uh, they're just beautiful fossils. So, you know, I see, here's my hand. And, uh, you know, roly polies, the little potato bugs, they uh, call them, they crawl around in your hand. Could you let these crawl around on your hand, do you think? Or? I don't know. Probably. <laughs> I'm not I, sure. I've never seen one, but I'd probably let it crawl around on my hand. I've held tarantulas before. <laughs> I have a picture of my wife with a 40-pound boa constrictor <laughs> <laughs> crawling on well, her. I don't know. Maybe someday on uh, the other side of creation or heaven, uh, 
Maybe some of these will exist and we'll see them there. <laughs> I, you know, they, there's a lot of places in this world that we have never explored. And I've gone out, I drove across the northern United States, and for four days, I never saw another person, another vehicle. Wow. Yeah. Four days. Yeah. Driving. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, well, maybe maybe there's some that exists. You know, they, they found the coelacanth. Uh, they and, did. And they thought, hey, man, we found a, a, a living fossil. So maybe somewhere... The trilobite exists. That would be really cool. That would be really cool. That would be <laughs> awesome. So, all right, what else you got? Well, we have some petrified wood over here. Uh, petrified wood is just beautiful. It's fun to cut it up and look at it. And uh, if you saw this rock laying out in the desert, you wouldn't think anything about it. Right. You see these little trails in here, and it's got holes in it. Okay. And when we polished this oh, up. Oh, wow. Those are holes from teredo worms. Huh. They're uh, still alive in the oceans today. They're shipworms, and a wooden ship yeah. will be eaten with the, by these. And if you look really closely, you can still see the tree rings there um, across here. There are so many holes in here, it's hard to yeah. follow them across. I think I kind of see them. Yeah. You can wow. see them. Yeah. But this is my pride and joy here. This is the one that I really like because most of your textbooks say that it requires 10 to 100 million years for wood to petrify. Sure. They're not really lying to you, but if you put a tree in the water today and there's yeah. no minerals in it, it doesn't petrify. But uh, some researchers stuck a block of wood in a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park and in just one year... It was petrified. Wow. One year. One year. I think, don't they actually make um, petrified, like, tables now that they you can do. buy? And they petrify those in less than a year, I bet. This here was given to me. This is a, was a cedar fence post planted in about 1900. You can still see the flat bottom there. And uh, the, they gave me the original note from the guy. It was dug up in 1947 at Tillamook, Oregon, and uh, he tells where it's at and who owned it and everything, and the man's name is Boyd Sissick. And so this cedar fence post petrified in 45 to 47 years. Now let me see this. This is amazing. It's it's actually a rock. See, it I'm, is. I don't want to break a glass, but I'm just <laughs> I'm just proving that it actually is. Petrified wood. It's that's amazing. 1945, I know it says. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. Well, it didn't take very long. Yeah, yeah. Now, these look interesting. These, um, is this your art collection here? Yeah, this is my art collection. These are ancient carvings by the Peruvians. They're called Ica burial stones, and they find these buried with the mummies. That one down there uh, still smells bad because it was laying on a mummy. Now, we... Where's, but where was the daddy? That's what I want to know. Mummy, daddy. Mummy, daddy. daddy. <laughs> Sorry, uh, bad well, joke. Well, I did find some... I unwrapped a mummy down there one time, and boy, I have really big hands. Yeah, you do. And Look so, at this. See? Wow. So, <laughs> nobody has rubber gloves that fit me. Oh, no. I worked as a medical assistant, and my boss had to buy me special gloves and I carried them around in my car, so when I went to this office or that doctor's office, yeah. I had gloves that would fit me because right, nobody good. else did. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I <clears> unwrapped <throat> that mummy barehanded. Don't ever do that. Right, no, that not good. That stink stays in your hand for several months. Well, it's, it's decay. It's, it it's, is. It's uh, not good for it. Bad bacteria. It, you could have died from that, Stan. I know. That was bad. <laughs> but anyway, these show... These are just replicas here. Okay. Now, how do you know they're replicas? Because I made them. Oh. <laughs> okay. And you can make your own in your own kitchen, I right? Make, I can make my <laughs> own replicas. I had the real one, and we made replicas. Uh, because I think the kids ought to be able to pick these all this stuff up and handle it and look at it. Yeah, yeah. And I, this is a replica right here. I, oh. brought the, I brought the real one out of Peru myself. So we, you, do you made this one? I made this one. Okay, and what did you use to to make it? The the etchings. This this is uh, 
Quartzite? What is that? This is uh, andesite. Andesite, okay. And I just paint the real one with latex rubber. Oh, wow. And then I fill it up with this plastic and and paint it. And this is basically what the real one looks like. Fascinating. But almost exactly. Yeah. Because the latex, you can paint latex rubber on your finger. Yeah. And it'll make your fingerprint. Yeah, so like if you're painting a latex paint and you get it on your finger, you mm -hmm. can peel it off and get your fingerprint on it? So that's kind of what you did? This is what I did. Wow. Okay, so I love your, your whole cabinet of fake uh, stones. No, no, these are real, aren't they? Some of, some of these are real. And we purchased uh, 10 real stones from the Aeronautical Museum at Lima, Peru. They gave us a letter of authenticity. Yeah. They were actually dug by professional, real archaeologists yeah. uh, under the uh, supervision of the universities down there. Okay. And so we have ten stones. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a replica of one of them, but this is a medical stone. You can see the surgeon right here. Mm -hmm. You can see his knives. Mm -hmm. The patient is here, and he's working on oh his intestines. Oh, my gosh. You can see his intestines. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And it, there's this plant and it goes around and goes into the person's mouth i uh, i don't know but i would assume that yeah. that's probably anesthesia of some kind okay now just for some of you who don't know um in in nazca peru what nazca 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 ica ica true that area um there are these stones they find buried with the bodies and i've been to the cabera museum right. uh in ica right Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've seen these stones, and a lot of, a very small percentage of them are actually have uh, dinosaur-type creatures etched onto them. In fact, we can identify uh, seropods, and I think, as you said, just about every just type about of dinosaur. Every kind, every kind there yeah. of dinosaur there is, yeah. is etched on these stones. Yeah, and some people um, kind of say, well, you know, because they were valuable and people are buying them, that uh, a whole bunch of replicas were made, so you really can't trust which ones are, are the originals and which ones are, and some people just kind of stay away from the subject. So, but the fact that, that you have letters of authenticity from the archaeologists in Peru saying, we dug these up with the bodies, they weren't replicated somewhere, and they have dinosaur etchings on them, then that would actually give strong indication that, that the ink, the, well, I don't think the, uh, it was the Incas, but even before that, uh, the potentially. I Ica people. Ica people, thank you. I-C-A. I-C-A, there I -C -A, you go. I-C-A, just like Ica, only Inca. And there's uh, where they are in Peru. Yeah. Very good. This is one of the driest deserts in the world right here. That's right. That's right. It gets one inch of rain in a hundred years. That's, yeah. Coming from Portland, that's, uh, that's really dry. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so if you come to the museum, you can see these, inspect them, uh, see his letter of authenticity. So, that's really cool. Let's keep moving on here. Okay. Well, one of the questions I get asked a lot of times is, do you really believe in Noah's flood? How could water have covered Mount Everest? Mm -hmm. Well, in 1924, when Odell summited Mount Everest, they found ammonite shells on top of Mount Everest. Okay, these are ammonite shells? These are ammonites. Wait a minute. You're saying that on top of 30,000 feet in the air they found these shells? Yeah, it's well documented. I even have a school textbook that says they found, found shells on top of Mount Everest. It's a school textbook. Wow. So you know, I can just imagine this: these animals and these shells uh, joined the Sherpas and they walked up to the top and they died there, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah. These are like squid with shells. Oh, well, that would be harder, wouldn't they, it, to climb? Yeah, they probably <laughs> swam in thin air. Right. <laughs> or there's another option. Maybe, just maybe, there are sedimentary layers on top and that they were part of the flood. They were part of the flood. Yeah. And the mountains rose and the valley sank and the water ran back into the sea. So these shells are found on tops of high mountains. That's amazing. Come and see them at the museum. Two of these shells I bought from uh, children cultivating cornfields on top of the Andes Mountains in Peru. Really? They cost me 25 cents a piece. Nice. And children, I felt bad just giving them a quarter, but... 
Well, that's not what you, you scored there, man. Yeah, I did. <laughs> that's great. Well, they're probably grateful for that quarter, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you came in, I showed you that one box of leaves, or leaf fossils over there. Yeah. Here's some more of the Clarkie leaf fossils. Okay. Uh, these are part of my collection. I have literally thousands, probably tens of thousands of leaves in my personal collection. And some of the ones that I've split, I have found orange, red, uh, yellow. They generally will turn black within 45 to 60 seconds. Wow. It, 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 That's amazing. It, and, and they smell, too, right? They smell like... like... Uh, a friend of mine, Bruce Malone was here in January and spoke at one of our conferences and I gave him some of the fossils and I, I let him unwrap them because I wanted to just get his reaction and he said, wow, this smells like leaves that I raked up last fall. Oh, yeah. And I said, yeah, that's a, that's a 15 million year old uh, scent. Now, you have a textbook here and I think it, it talks about these type of leaves from this formation. Yeah, this is, this is actually a picture of the Idaho leaf fossils, and it talks about it down here. Then on this previous page, it talks about the DNA, extracting DNA out of these fossil leaves. DNA? DNA. Doesn't DNA break down pretty quick? DNA breaks down really quick. I have a paper from uh, Nature Magazine right here. Nature? Nature okay. News. DNA has a 521-year half-life. I've probably got 10 papers on a 521-year half-life. Wow. So I contacted one of the people that worked with the leaves and said, well, how much percentage is left in the leaves? They really didn't want to put a number on it, but finally right. one of the girls did. She yeah. said, well, maybe one three hundred or one four hundred. She said, it's really hard to say. Yeah. So this is a 521-year half-life chart. And if there's about one three hundredth to one four hundredth, that's between eight and a quarter and eight and a half half lives. <coughs> okay. Well, if you have eight and a quarter half lives, you multiply eight point two five times five hundred and twenty one, gives you about forty three hundred years to forty four hundred and fifty years. Well, that's when the Bible says Noah's flood happened. Now, how do we know that Noah's flood happened right around in that range of years? That's uh, well. This paper also says that DNA breaks down uh, d at different rates under different uh, uh, environment. Yeah, so, so like different oxygen in the atmosphere and right. all that. Because you're measuring carbon-14 in these leaves? Well, that's radiocarbon dating. The DNA is different. Oh, of course. I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah, and so the DNA breaks down at, at, at doesn't necessarily break down at a constant rate so it's still in the the dinosaur dna is about one five hundredth i was told yeah well that's nine half lives that's still 4689 years so wow that still puts dinosaurs buried about the time of noah's flood wow that's amazing Wait a minute. So this, I, I asked you. I'm sorry. I asked you about Noah's flood. How do we know that it happened in that time period? What what indicators do we have? The Bible. The Bible. Yes. The Bible says that there was about 400, 4,500 4, years ago. Yeah, and and you get that by counting the years in Genesis between the generations, mm -hmm. and you can pretty much determine. We know uh, 2,000 years ago, about approximately Jesus lived, uh, when Abraham lived, and then we can actually use the generations. It gives us actual numbers of when we can count back. And we roughly say about 43 and 50 years ago, roughly. So it, it, somewhere in that neighborhood. But that, those fit. Those numbers fit for DNA uh, percentage that's still left. So that's amazing. And so this is their science. Yeah. This is Nature News. Wow. Nature won't publish anything, any experiment I do because I'm a creationist and a Christian. Oh, come on. It's the truth, though, right? It is. <laughs> but... Yeah. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what else we got? Oh, we have dinosaur eggs over here. Eggs. Uh, dinosaur eggs are lots of fun. 
I made, so this would make a great breakfast, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I made, made these, uh, the real ones look just like this, but I make these out of uh, resin plastic so that I can let the kids play with them. Yeah. And if they drop them, they don't break. Right. But right. Um, you can, uh, you see like on Jurassic Park and some of those things were great big dinosaur eggs. Right. Not possible. Right. Scientifically, I can show you the maximum size of eggs. Wrong. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I remember this. This is a. Uh... As as an egg gets bigger. Yeah. The surface area to volume ratio goes down. Right. The baby has to breathe through that shell. Wow. Otherwise, it suffocates. Yeah. This is a one by one by one cubic inch. Okay. So there's six square inches of surface area. One cubic inch of volume, that gives you a ratio of one to six. Okay. Now if you go to a six by six by six cubic inch, yeah. you have 216 square inches of surface area, mm -hmm. 216 cubic inches of volume for a one to one ratio. Okay, so this is real science, it's mathematics, right? This is real science, this is real <laughs> mathematics. And so the bigger the egg gets, the thicker the shell gets, so it makes it harder for the baby to breathe. So the largest the egg can be, scientifically, is about 12 by 10. That's about this big. Yeah. And dinosaur, that's a bird egg, an elephant bird egg from Madagascar. Wow. They, they come that big? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And they, they, they say that dinosaur eggs, I've got uh, secular books, Secular dinosaur experts, and they talk about dinosaur eggs, and they say dinosaur wow. eggs are most generally smaller than the elephant bird eggs. Wow. And huh. so Camarasaur and Apatosaur, their eggs are about this big around, and this is a parasaurial office, and this would be the size they were when they hatched. This is an actual replica of an actual Hadrosaur or parasaurial office egg. Cool. And this would have been the size they were when they hatched. I love the pink. Is that uh, is that your own artist interpretation? That is not mine. Oh. I gave the girls uh, lots of leeway. <laughs> and this one is a girl. Of course. And this one is a boy. The blue? Yeah, of course. It gives so, it away. Oh, well. <laughs> I wouldn't have done it that way. but Right, like, right. The, the kids love it. Yeah, and this, they do. And so... Uh, this is a hadrosaur. It would have hatched from an egg that size, and that's how big it would have been compared to a man. Wow. And a, this is a parasaurial office. Uh, wow. It would have been the same thing. So that little guy ended up being that, that big as a man, or bigger than a man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 40 wow. feet. Some of them are 40 feet long. And I think so, I want a, a pet, like, on a leash and stuff. Is that here? Or play fetch, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> so, anyway, Noah could have easily had all the kinds of dinosaurs on an ark. On yeah. The ark, yeah. Easily. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of your dinosaur experts say there's between 40 and 65 kinds of dinosaurs. Okay. But the average size of the dinosaur is about the size of this one down here. Very good. Yeah. Oops, sorry. There we go. And so he, uh, this this is the average size. This one up here is a big one of his species. Oh wow! Very this, good. This is called a Jeholosaurus. Jeholosaurus. That's awesome. In China. We have a lot of great stuff. In fact, <clears throat> right in the middle of the uh, museum is this. Uh, Giant mastodon skull. Where did, where did you get this? Uh, Joe Taylor got this uh, from San Antonio, Texas, and I helped Joe. Uh, I built the most of the armature for it, and and uh, we molded it and made replicas of it. Wow! And one of the replicas I made, Joe and I took to the Tucson Fossil Show. And Joe sold it to a guy in Korea, so we boxed it up and shipped it to Korea. All right. So our my artwork is in international. <laughs> nice. Well, cool. This is awesome. I really hope that people have the chance to come and visit the museum here in Boise. Um, just look it up, Northwest Science Museum. Yeah. Okay. And as far as, I mean, this is fairly small space. This is a great first step. But, you know, what does the future look like for the museum? Well, we've already, we're working on financing right now. 
to purchase another building and uh, we've made an offer on the building and so we're hoping to purchase that building soon mm -hmm. and move into it mm -hmm. as a next step okay uh, I would, uh, I for years, I wanted to build a full-scale model of Noah's Ark, and I, yeah. would, I would like to do it in the Treasure Valley, because yeah. this, in the Pacific Northwest, or actually in the West, this is the closest to all the, within a day's drive of most of the Western United States. Oh, that's a good point. So, like, um, Ensign and Genesis built the big Ark Encounter uh, in Kentucky, so in one day's drive, a lot of the, the Eastern United States. Right. So this is kind of... The, the Ark of the West, then, huh? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, you aren't going to put it up on some mountain like it landed there, or, you know? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, We'd shit. like to put it out here by <laughs> I-84 so people drive by it and, yeah. and see it. Yeah. That'd be cool to have, a, you know, an Ark in every country or, you know, in every yeah. area to be a witness tool for yeah, the flood. Well. And I've heard stories. I have a friend who... Visited a friend out near the ark, took her through, and it, it transformed her life uh, spiritually. So it's a great witnessing tool, it and is. I really pray that God blesses you to, to build that. That would be awesome. It would. It's cool. It would. It so would. We're working towards that right now, and, <coughs> and uh, it's just amazing all the, all the stuff that we have right here in Idaho that's so important mm -hmm. to creation science. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank. Oh, oh. Um, oh, where do people go to find out more? Uh, Northwest Science Museum and. Uh, What's your website? N uh, NorthwestScienceMuseum.com, I believe. Okay. I'm. I'm not a very. <laughs> I can build these things. Right. <laughs> I let my tech people take care of that. No, no problem. <laughs> well, cool, Stan. Thank you so much. You I appreciate thanks, the guys. visit. All yeah. right. All right. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye bye.